Um, it's interesting being here at this conference. So I'm try though this is going to talk about a hospital project, I'm not um, trying to explain how to build a hospital. Um, it's really about um, addressing um, high-risk endeavors. And so this is just an example of, of a high-risk endeavor. So I'm hoping it, it, it comes across as having some generally applicable lessons. Um, so um, I'm, I, I work for the owner, and I was overseeing this project in, in Castro Valley, which is about um, 30 miles from here to the east. Um, and um, let's start. So I'm going to go through a couple of things. I'll just briefly explain what the project was, just so you have some background. Then there's this thing I call the dragon of uncertainty, which is the thing that plagues our business. But people don't really talk about uncertainty specifically in our business. Um, there are some inconvenient truths about project delivery, which are other things that people don't really talk about in our business. Um, and then there were some strategies we implemented on the project that um, uh, allowed us to be successful. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the outcomes. And then I'm hoping to get through this relatively quickly. So if you have any questions at the end, um, we'll have time for that as well. Um, OK. So the project. So this is a, a rendering of the project probably back in 2006, 2007, before we'd even really started the, the full-on design process. So it's a medium-sized hospital in California um, for a significant amount of money. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of financial constraints in the money market, so there was not much money available to borrow beyond what Sada also self-finances. So there was a lot of pressure on this project to please don't go over budget and please don't be late. Um, there are other specific challenges for this project. We were using a brand new contract model, which I'll speak about a little bit. Um, uh, there's a new clinical care model in place, so we hadn't really built a hospital like this before, so there was relatively little experience there. I won't talk about that, though. Um, we had to finish the project 30% quicker than a hospital typically takes um, in the state. Um, there was an absolute cap on funding um, because um, uh, we had very little money as, a, as, a, as an enterprise uh, during these years. So if we were going to go over on a large project, we would probably have to cancel like small clinic projects in the Central Valley. Um, there had to be lead silver. It's on a very constrained site. And best of all, it's right next to uh, the South Haywood Fort. Um, so it had to be particularly seismically compliant. It's in the severest earthquake zone in the state. Um, so there were very, very stringent requirements on this project. The South Haywood Fault, if you're from the Bay Area, you might know that's the one that's regularly voted as the fault most likely to fail next in, the, uh, in California. So it's almost certain that this hospital will experience a major earthquake during its life. Um, so in summary, it's a, it's a very high-risk project and the stakeholders have a lot to lose, which I think is typical for any major complicated project in any industry. Um, so the challenges were basically the three values that this project had, like please preserve the scope, please be on budget, and please be on time, which is, I think, a typical list of constraints for any, any major project, regardless of what industry you're in. Um, but however, the typical performance for uh, hospital projects, especially in this state, is that the scope is compromised, the budget is exceeded, and it opens late. That's typical. Um, and the only way you keep often you keep the budget in line and the schedule in line is by compromising the scope and then not talking about it. So there are a lot of projects that appear to be successful, but they're not. Um, and compromising scope is so normal, it's not actually seen as necessarily that bad. You always have to value engineer a project during construction because they're always going late and they're always going over budget. Um, you talk to anybody in the business and everybody acknowledges this. You talk to anybody in the C-class in, in corporations and they all get very mystified by this. There's an interesting disconnect uh, in, the, in the hierarchies of a lot of our businesses. Um, so here's this thing called the dragon of, of uncertainty. I drew this a few years ago for a conference when I was trying to articulate what I was really talking about. The problem with major projects is the major risk is the uncertainty. You're not certain you can deliver the scope. You're not certain you can deliver the project on budget. And you're not certain you can deliver it on time. And we do all kinds of things in our business that feed this dragon, make it bigger than it needs to be. And in this diagram, uh, the dragon is squatting on the clock, which represents your schedule. It's got its claws and a bag of money, which represents your budget. And over on the left, it's value engineering your project, um, So, which is an also typical strategy in our business. You compromise what you really, the vision, right at the end, often. Um, so there are several inconvenient truths, and I broke my own rule a bit here by putting lots of words on the slides, but I will go 
Um, so nearly all the risks are known by your team, but not at the leadership level. That's one big truth about this business. When you build a hospital, you have a very large team of experts who probably built one or two hospitals before. And if you actually talk to them, they can list out everything that's gone wrong. Um, and yet, at the management level, these projects are not necessarily perceived as catastrophically risky. Um, work is typically done in expert silos with very little cross-discipline collaboration um, because of the way we typically contract for work. And yet, it's never really kind of framed this way, so it's not really perceived as a terrible idea. Um, uh, people, therefore, work to minimize the risks for the financial organization to which they belong rather than for the project that they're on. They will try to minimize the risks for the project, but at the end of the day, they want to keep their job with the company that they work for. They maybe would like to get promoted with the company that they work for. So when push comes to shove, they're going to preserve the financial interests of their company and not of the project. And this is also a product of the way we contract for work and we set up the financial structures on projects. Um, budget in hospital projects is typically not used as an explicit parameter of design. There's always this general sense that, of course, a project should be designed in a way that makes it possible to come on budget, but because of the way we typically come up with the design and then when we price it, we usually find out too late that we're over budget and there isn't uh, this ongoing focus on always knowing how much a design is going to cost before you ever get into um, execution. Um, and so therefore, typically, design is completed during implementation. I don't know what the analogy for other businesses would be, but maybe it's testing. Um, but in construction, it's more simple. You, uh, once you're building it, you realize you didn't know as much as you thought you did about what you would need to know in order to design with reliability, and you fix them in construction. And it's the worst time to, to find these things out because you usually have limited choices and it's extremely expensive. Um, so there's some truth-based strategies that we put in place on this project. Um, we explicitly got together as a large team to identify the key risks and opportunities of a project like this. Um, the team told me they hadn't really ever been asked to do this before, and I'll go through a one example that I like from the project. Um, we, we, we consciously established a 24-hour, seven days a week collaborative environment for the team to try and break down the silos and get the team to feel that they're a single team, not a bunch of like 20, 30, 50, 100 teams. Um, and we explicitly took on the challenge of designing the design process um, and not believing that designers know how to design a building, therefore just leave them to do it. We, we were acknowledging that collectively as a team, all we have is a bunch of people who know how to, how to design their own work, that they don't necessarily as a team know how to design the team's work. Um, and we did found ways to make budget a key parameter of design through the design process so that we could bring budget certainty to this project. Um, and finally, we committed to modeling for fabrication, or designing for fabrication, rather than just designing to convey intent, which is, uh, which is, a, which is, a, common, which is a historical practice in, in um, uh, design practices in this country, to design to convey design intent, not to design with the idea that it must be good enough to fabricate and assemble. But that's for other people to figure out. Um, and then once we've done that, why, you don't want to waste all the effort you put in. Why not make sure you actually build what was designed? Again, it's going beyond this idea of, oh, yeah, the design is communicating intent, or the requirements are communicating intent. No, we want the requirements to be very explicit. And then see if we can come up with ways and make sure we can do this. And interestingly, even though this logically makes a lot of sense, it's not typical practice at all. Even now, it's becoming more typical, but still this is a highly unusual way of uh, going about a large capital project in, in, uh, in the United States. So here's one of the things that we uncovered. I'll focus on the right-hand side. This is about putting doors in a hospital. Um, and this is all the things that the team said that had typically gone wrong on prior projects. And I won't go through them all, but essentially what it's saying is that typically, once you get above maybe 200 doors in a building, typically everything goes wrong. You'll have everything that could go wrong with a door go wrong somewhere in your project once you get up into the hundreds of doors. And this is just how it is. The doors don't have the necessary clearance for airflow control. Some of the doors hit the surfaces. Some of the doors don't fit in the frame you put in. Some of the hardware doesn't really fit with the door. Some of, someone forgets that it also needs a card reader and power. 
Um, they're complicated animals, but typically what often happens in projects is you, you buy the hardware from one company, you buy the door from a second company, you buy the frame from a third company, and you have an equivalent series of companies all designing those elements for you, and the contracts put the people who supply the parts at risk for the failure of the door to work because they, they have the least resources to hire lawyers to defend themselves in court. So once you stand back and understand that, you realize, oh, we have a system that's designed for failure. So why do we have it? Well, it's because each company's figured out how to make money despite the nonsense of the, of the outcome. Um, and so we did a lot of these sessions about elevators and rebarring concrete and you just all of these things that go wrong and yet there's no learning in, in the business, no real learning. So we're trying to, like in this project, become a learning organization by doing the simplest of things, by asking the human beings on the project, what have you learned? And listing them out and saying, wouldn't it be good if this didn't happen on this project? And so it's just a very simple, it's not a very complicated um, I, I thing to execute. Uh, it's just having the idea and doing it. Um, so this is another one where the, in this room in, in, in Texas, we have our mechanical engineer designers with our trade companies that are going to install the, the design mechanical systems for air conditioning and plumbing, etc., working with a company that makes the software they both use to make it possible for them to work on the same design but have different tools come up on their screen depending on whether you're a designer logging into the file or a fabricator logging into the file. So on this project, we had no handoff on the, on the air conditioning system. It was always a single file being worked on but with a blended team of designers and fabricators, which in the business I work in is extremely unusual. Today, it's also extraordinarily rare. Um, but it's what you need to do if you want to get risk out of the project. Um, so what they did was, hey, what if, if you allowed us to spend 10 grand to fly 12 people to Texas and meet with a software company, we could do this. And I'm going, well, it's a $320 million project. Maybe 12 grand is, is, a, is a really, really worthwhile investment. So we did that, and, they, and, and it worked. Um, so the idea is just talk to the team, ask them what they've learned that, that went wrong, what opportunities have they always wanted to take advantage of but haven't been able to, and try and find a way to allow that to happen. Um, so this is the other. Um, this is part of establishing a, a collaborative environment. We changed the way we contract for work. Now I don't know what the analogous would be across industries, but we're a very highly um, um, balkanized um, environment for capital project delivery in the United States. You typically write individual contracts where everybody does their piece of work, and there's no way for them to collectively succeed and fail as a big team. They'll just succeed and fail based on the terms of the contract that they signed. Um, so what we did is we tried to loop the key risk holders together in one contract, create a single pool of money that, that would get bigger if they were successful and get a lot smaller if they, were, if they weren't successful, to try and get them to forget, a, to make, make their behaviors align with what we wanted as a project team. And so there wouldn't be this, what I was talking about before, this inherent disconnect between loyalty to the companies they work for and loyalty to the project. So we also literally got people to literally work in the same space. This is during the design phase. We leased the space near the project and had everybody um, not necessarily co-locate there, but it, will, we, it was a meeting resource where everybody came together for two days every two weeks and uh, could be held for meetings on any other time. And in there we had the owner, that's me so many years ago, um, uh, with the engineers and trade companies all looking at the model in the screen arguing about uh, are we going to be successful here or not, essentially. The other thing we did was, oh, and this is during construction, we rented a enormous, like 16 trailers, took all the interior walls out and created a single 5,000 square foot space for all of the trades to work together with hotel spaces for all of the designers to come, to come um, uh, as needed. So we were trying to break down the traditional silos, which happened simply because you put people in separate trailers next to each other They'll just sit in their trailers and what you want is to allow people to have incidental conversations about everything they need to talk about simply because the person is right there or right there. And Because humans are weird. Some conversations won't happen because to talk to that person you have to get up, leave a trailer, go into an extra trailer and see if they're there. And there's this whole this weird dynamic of leaving your space and then invading someone else's space. 
So it's a really, it's a subtle thing, but it's also very important. But what I found separate to this is that even when you do this, you should be paying attention to are people really still talking to each other? Because they can still feel awkward about getting up and walking over to talk to people if there's this weird, if a, if a weird implicit culture has been set up. Um, and on this project, we created a virtual environment where we, we shared all of the uh, data and learning and files together. So we're building one three-dimensional model together as a team. I won't go into what the software is because that's not the point of this slide. It's just that people, we had one set of files for the project. You didn't have copies on your, you didn't have copies on your computer and upload them for reference. The file that you worked on lived here. So there's only one version and anybody who needed to see it was able to see it. So um, we were getting rid of the terrible waste of people working on the wrong versions of files. Um, and then we located the servers all across the country depending on where the companies worked because for whatever reason our team was pretty much spread all over the United States. Um, so design the design process. So this is where again you want to talk to the team about well how are we actually going to go about executing the project that we have ahead of us and we would get together and have like this is like a conceptual argument about well should we do the floors first or the walls first and when should we dimension these things so it doesn't really matter that that was the conversation it's just getting your design team leads with their trade leads to talk about well what should we do first and what rework will we happen how can we minimize the rework in this flow of work what's the most what makes the most sense for us and this took maybe four or five hours of 15 people to create this diagram this was not so you ask somebody how to do it and you expect because you're an experienced team somebody just goes up and maps a very nice diagram and then we argue about that diagram no it's like no one knows I, I found in our business I don't know if it translates across industries but if you get a big team together of the people who actually do the work it's, and they haven't really worked together a lot before uh, this detail it takes forever to even draw the first box. You know, what's a floor plan? You know, they maybe argue about what a floor plan is. You know, does it include the furniture? Or doesn't it? Is it? You know, I don't know, things like. You know, do you have conversations like that? And then you can take it further, make it more explicit by using post-its and more more detailed descriptions and more boxes. And then on our project, because it's so complicated, you put it into software, and it doesn't matter what the software is, it just, it's a way of keeping track of an increasingly complicated network of, of tasks. And the simple idea is that each box needs to be done before the next box, because the next box would have to be done at significant risk if the prior box is not executed. Um, and as you uncover these, you find we always learn all the time that getting anything done is a lot more complicated than we thought. And this is just... Uh, we created an environment where we plotted it out and the team, and they're not designing the building here, they're simply discussing how are we going to design the building. And they're arguing about, well, what does this box mean? Or do you really need this before my work? Or do you need it now? Or why are you saying it's going to take 10 days? Can you get it done in three days? And it's basically, the idea was to get the team, as human beings, physically engaged in a single conversation about what are we going to do, and not sitting in a room figuring out how they're going to get their works done. It's more about a broader team discussing how the team's going to get the team's work done. And then using budget as a key parameter of design, we came up with single sheets to track the budget during the project. Instead of having, in our business, we typically have multi-hundred page reports that get issued by the general contractor every month that I, that I never read. So we decided to, let's create something that someone might actually read because they could read it in a few minutes. So we came up with this way of summarizing a project in a way that made sense. And the details of this are not important. It's just the idea if financial performance is key on a project, make sure there's a visual way of tracking it so we all know where we're at. Um, and then we told people the summary. The team would always see this in the trailer saying, you know, we need to make more money. So remember that. And as you're doing this, everything's not well right now or is well from a financial point of view. It's just a reminder to the team that financial performance for the project and your, and your companies is very important. Uh, and this, depending on who you work with, this is at the most sophisticated end. It's like um, the general contractor had a way of literally pricing the, the drywall and the concrete directly out of the model. Um, it takes a lot of work to get to this point, but like that's, you know, at the, at the the cutting edge in our business of making sure that um, budget is a, is a parameter of design. And then this idea is that like committing 
to modeling for fabrication. So this is just an idea that you start with these virtual representation of what you're working on and eventually you get to the actual thing and can you come up with a way of making them link with certainty so that the ideal is if the things that make the models use these files then that's inherently gives you certainty so you want to challenge the team to get as close to that as possible can you can you get the virtual representation to be the thing that's used to guide the actual thing um, and in this case it's it's duck work ending up on a truck being shipped to site um, and we you know so we had very detailed conversations about everything because we wanted to, to know everything was right so you make it very visual in, in the 3d model and you argue about these complicated things of trying to keep all of these elements away from each other and meet all of the requirements for a code compliance in a building and this is another good one like um, libraries of there's a library fixture in red there, but the actual fixture looks like the blue one. And in a building like a hospital, the, the differences are, would kill you if you didn't know that, wow, we have a vision that we're going to represent virtually the actual object. So let's do that, because if we, if we just go with the library, um, we'll have a very expensive problem in the field. Um, and then this is the team actually, the daily discussions about what they're gonna, how they're going to build the model in the trailer um, and so that's the, the the representation of the building on the outside and that's kind of what it looked like when we built it um, and then for instance so this is the uh, complex network of air conditioning in the building but this is the model and so they're like they're bang on and that's what we wanted to do we were not doing design intent on this project we were actually going to fabrication level of design and we also did scanning of the actual built conditions. This is a, the dotted fuzzy stuff is a, an actual scan of an actual concrete wall. And then you can lay that on top of the model to make sure that the holes that you left in that wall line up with where the piping's coming. So we were just, we were, as we built it, we were just checking that we were building exactly what we modeled. And so the outcomes were we basically had almost no variation uh, in the cl major clinical functions in this hospital. Um, it cost a few million less than expected, which is, um, if you don't work in this business, it seems like, well, you save 1%, well, well done. But like in our business, these projects often go 5 to 10% over and are a year late. So this was a huge win for us to actually have any money left at the end. Um, and it opened uh, like a month early, which again, these projects often run six months, nine months late, um, and, and um, even, even years late. And then the rework, which is the waste of like doing things more than once, drop, plummeted on this project um, because of all the effort we put in and productivity went up. And just this is like I like to put this in because this is the world of uh, hospital construction in California. We had to pass 4,955 state inspections during this project. So we're building it for three, three years, 36 months. So we're passing over 100 inspections every month for three years. And we had a 96% success rate, which is also extremely hard to do. It's incredibly hard to do. Um, I, I, on, if you are below, well, here's the thing. If you're below 90, you're going to be over budget and late. And a lot of projects are in the 85, in the mid 80s. And it's really hard to get over 90. Um, you need to be over 90 to have even a shot of being on time in California. And this is really hard to do. But because it's so hard to do, it's only hard to do because not enough effort is put in the design phase. That's all that needs to do. You just need to pour all of the effort and attention into the design phase. And because that's not done, it becomes incredibly hard to pass all of your inspections at that, that, this, that, that, this level. And so that was really it. So I was just wanted to... It's just like risk management is just an exercise in thinking, uh, it's getting your team to talk about what the risks really are and developing strategies to address them. And um, my feeling is that often on complex projects, that conversation never really happens and we just, we just accept um, uh, poor performance as normal, what you're going to do, it's a big project, it's very complicated, what do you expect? You know, so it's sort of having like a, what I call like a, um, a no excuse no excuses kind of mindset so and that's what I that's what I bring to the projects that I run yeah so I mean, this, it was really interesting and there's a lot of very similar things that happen in software
Right. Oh. Very, very similar uh, types of things. One thing that I was very curious about, though, was um, the contracts part of it. Like, yes. Can you describe a little bit more about how you did the contract? And yeah. So what we did was we basically identified the key risk holders on the design and the trade side. So anybody who controls a lot of the work, and if, if, if they perform, perform poorly, they're going to put a lot, the project as a whole at risk. So we created a single contract that they all signed. So we, didn't, we only went with one contract that contained all of the terms you would typically see distributed across all the contracts. And the important thing was the business deal that was attached to the contract. And the business deal said, you as a big team will tell me how much is this going to cost and when will the building open. And we'll write that into the contract. And inside that number you're giving me, we're going we're gonna to agree a, a certain amount of money. On this project, it was like $15 million. If you're successful, you as a team will make $15 million and you'll split it up the way you normally split it up. If you're contributing half of the money up front, you'll get half of the money at the end. So if the pot gets bigger, you'll get half of the bigger pot. If the pot gets smaller, you'll get half of the smaller pot. And, if, and so we agree how much of that pot each company would get. And then what we said was, if, the, if, if you do a bad job of predicting how much this is going to cost, you will pay for that overrun out of your profits. <coughs> If you, if you do a really good job of controlling your costs and it costs less, that difference will get thrown into that pool and the pool will get bigger. And in our business, because if the schedule runs late, your budget goes with it, that also was the constraint on schedule because there are millions of dollars a month get added to the cost of a project if it runs late. And conversely, if it runs early, you typically save millions of dollars. So that was the essential business deal. And it was the idea of getting them all to sign up for the same business deal would help them all work together. Was that a pretty long negotiation? Yes. Like yeah, and it hadn't really ever been done before on a major project. I, I think it hadn't been done on a major project in the United States at all. It been done on a smaller project. Um, it took like 15 months of negotiation to get that nailed. Um, because they, have a, they, they, you know, they had a lot of nervousness about doing things differently and would this really work so, so yeah that's essentially the deal so does anyone else have any questions I'll make a comment yeah um, I've been re recently working with a one of the largest architectural firms in the world and the, I went to the owner and said hey we should do a risk workshop on this project right and we did a risk workshop on the project and the architect had never done a risk workshop. And it's as common sense as you make it sound. It is, right. And it is, baby, right? Right. It's really common sense. Right. For some reason, we go into the world in kind of Pollyanna state, thinking it's going to work out. Right. And the things we uncovered just scared the hell out of me. Right. Yeah, that, that would be typically the process. I think the humans, by nature, are extremely optimistic. Yeah. And it can cause problems at times. It's great. It's a great default state of mind, but um, it can cause you problems. And I say, yeah, you have that default. Thing. But when you start to talk about the risk, normally everyone gets terrified because they go, oh, suddenly every, you suddenly you see all of the risks, and you realize, oh wow, this is a, this is a scary project. Well, it only remains scary if you just list them and don't do anything. So. Yeah, just a month early, a month early. yes. Um, I was curious about, you know, it's, it's, um, it might not actually be to an advantage to do that, you know, given the, the organization's ability to have doctors ready and yes. all that kind of stuff. And I wonder if you just could talk about, I mean, the fact that I can imagine I'd want to, I'd, the earlier the better, right? The right. sooner we get this out of our hair, great. But, but how that worked with the turnover on a hospital project, there's, on a project like this, a medium-sized hospital, there's really no advantage to telling the owner any later than a year in advance that you're going to be early because it t does take tremendous amounts of preparation to move into a hospital. So uh, it, that's certainly true. If you suddenly accelerate on a five-year project in the last year, it's probably going to sit empty 
and they'll probably move in on the same day. But if you can do it earlier than that, and my thing is, if you, once you get confident with this new way of working, you can probably up front say, we're going to build this hospital faster. And then, and then you know, that way. But yeah, specific to hospitals is usually um, this, like uh, the cost of delay issue is not usually a, such a big problem. Um, but if you're, um, I mean, if you're going into a new market, that's th these ones we're typically doing now in California are replacement hospitals to meet the size, the new seismic compliance rules. So we typically have a hospital running, and we're replacing it. So if you finish early, finish late, from a purely operational perspective, it's not like we're typically building brand new hospitals in brand new markets at this point. Just and that's. But if you were, you could definitely. I think well, if you were just about, it would just be moving up your recruitment effort to get everybody into the new hospital. I think that acceleration would be more beneficial. So. So do you feel like that um, as a result of this, everyone involved in the project was like, yeah, this is so awesome, this is great, let's always build hospitals like this from now on? Yes. Or is it, or is it more like, oh, that was nice, and now we're back to doing it the way we used to do it? Well, yeah, I think some of them are like, it's really funny to me because I, I know some of the people on the Apple project. You would not believe how terribly, from a conceptual point of view, that project is structured, right? And so I know some of the people on this project are working on that project, and they say it's just the weirdest environment to go from this project to that in project, which is even more everyone is in silos, drawings are hidden. You, you can only look at the drawings when you're in the room. You can't take the drawings with you. You know, the, like the op almost like a military secret, that project. So the, I think they'll have fun in the construction phase. I'm looking, I'll be interested to see. It'll be, it'll be fine up until halfway through construction, and I want to see what happens. So, but, but no, no, the people who worked on the project um, were really happy. We made it very successful them from the, from the people uh, working in the trailer to the people who run the business. We're all very happy about it. But it does take tremendous effort to run projects like these. You need a very engaged leadership because you're trying to change a lot. You've got to, I was listening to the, the man talking downstairs about wiki management. I really hadn't heard anybody talk about that, but I recognize a lot of what we did and what he was talking about, is that as a leader, you're not doing command and control. You're creating an environment for everyone's learning to flow up, and that's what makes these projects much more successful, much more power, and so much more rewarding for the, for the people who are on them, because they have so much more autonomy and so much more agency. Agency is really the word on these projects. So like, it doesn't matter who you are. If you need to talk to this other person because they have information, you can just go talk to them. We don't have hierarchies. Very traditional projects, you have to go through your own hierarchy across and down, and the, the, the information goes, does this, right? But on this project, it goes, just go talk to whoever you need to talk to. Um, so they all very, found it very rewarding, and some of them have gone back to more traditional projects and found it very unsatisfying. Um, and and uh, it's been kind of depressing for them. Um, but it does take tremendous energy from the leadership on these projects. We have had another project that didn't go quite so well. Still went well better than industry standard, but didn't go quite as well because there was, an, a, there was a distinct absence of the energy from the leadership. There was like they were running a new model that they didn't intrinsically understand. Um, so it, 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 you need strong, lead strong leadership, not in the command and control aspect, but just in strong leadership, we are going to change things. Things are going to get better. We want to philosophically head this way, right? And so, yeah. One minute to go. So, right. do any, any other questions or? No. There's a small audience, but hopefully, I'm always, always, but I, I don't mind. So, it's like, because you never know which one person is going to go, go do something incredible. Um, as a result of these talks. No. Right. Thank you, JB. That was great. Okay.